Hey everybody, this is the Coffee of the Geek Show. My name is Andy Wheelock. It is November of 2019. Today I have someone on the phone with me from across the ocean, and it is Catherine Burble Singh, who is the founder and headmistress of the Michaela School in London. And I'm going to ask her uh, some quick questions on uh, her thoughts on education and uh, also educational technology. So, Catherine, let's start off with a pretty easy question. Can you tell me your kind of educational journey? Yes. Yeah, so, um, I was born in New Zealand, but I grew up mainly in Canada um, until the age of 15. I uh, went to a normal state school uh, where, oh, those are the pips here at school, so that's why. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no problem. Anything in the background. Um, and... Uh, went to normal state school where, you know, you good lessons, I don't know, sometimes the teacher wouldn't show up, um, uh, there was lots of disruption, uh, you know, the pretty standard thing, and then um, I came to England, and um, that's when I was doing my A-levels, um, and again, a pretty standard school, I remember being, um, I remember we were doing, we were doing English A-level, and some boy, I remember the teacher talking about the Second World War, and he said, when was that? <laughs> and um, and the teacher, I remember just being so horrified, how can you not know when the Second World War was? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was. I've, I've been to a, a variety of different schools as a kid, and they were all pretty typical, I'd say, of, of the state sector. So, um, first of all, let me just maybe talk from a, a fan of Dave, the Dave Rubin show, uh, what was that experience like? That must have been pretty pretty amazing. And I loved it that Dave brought on someone from the education sector. We don't often have that. It's usually politics or entertainment. Mm-hmm. Well, um, yeah, it was great. I mean, he it's always nice speaking to people who are open-minded and wanting to learn about education. Um, and I think, you know, he was making certain assumptions, as you may remember in the uh, interview, that I was trying to um, challenge him on. Um, you know, a lot of people often think that um, what you need to do is teach children creativity, and they don't understand that actually you become creative when you know lots about a particular subject. Um, and people think you need to teach them independent learning, but you can only think independently when you know lots about a subject. So the only way of getting children to be creative and independently minded is to uh, teach them lots of knowledge. Um, and that doesn't mean children sitting down and rote learning stuff uh, constantly. Some things might be rote learned, let's say like dates and history, um, or maybe your verb tables in French. But um, the main thing is that when you're learning something, that you are committing it to memory. That uh, I think sadly, and that doesn't mean rote learning. Committing to memory does not mean rote learning. It just means remembering it. Uh, sadly, I think that idea has been lost in modern uh, education. And so people, teachers will think they've taught something and they think the children have learned it. But then when it comes to remembering it, the children don't remember it. And you hear teachers and staff rooms all over the country saying, but I don't understand it. I mean, we've done it. We, 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 we learned it. We've done it so many times and they still can't remember it. And I would say that that's about the methods of teaching that's being used to teach them. Um, and that that's why they don't remember. And that's why teachers can feel very frustrated when all of their efforts seem to come to nothing when the child doesn't remember it. And ultimately, it's because in the first place, the, the teacher doesn't have as their goal that the child should remember what has been learned, you know? You know, I do. And, and I think you could certainly, that same, I guess, obstacle is happening here in the United States. I think, you know, I was just watching something on, on YouTube about, uh, you know, these, uh, an interviewer went to college campuses around Pennsylvania and asked the kids, you know, what was the Holocaust? And most of them, again, this isn't who knows how many truly kids knew, but there was a lot of them an alarming rate that didn't know what the Holocaust was or could name any of the significant events of it, um, which was rather alarming. So, yeah. Well, I, I, when I was one of my schools, I remember this boy who, uh, the, one of the last days before he left us, I was talking about the Holocaust, just uh, as an aside and lesson. And um, he said, what's that? And I went marching over to my principal's office and said, I can't believe we've got a boy who's leaving us and doesn't know what the Holocaust is. I mean, I wasn't asking him for any d details, just what is the Holocaust? He didn't know what that word meant. And I just, I was so horrified. And I remember being told, well, you know, he is in the bottom set, so that's kind of understandable. And I, 
was saying it's not understandable. I don't care how slow they are. Not knowing what the Holocaust is after 15 odd years of education is appalling. And, um, you know, I, I think we can often get too used to uh, these kind of standards. And we need to ask ourselves, well, why doesn't he know that? Because he will have been in lessons where it was taught. It wasn't that it wasn't taught. So then you need to think, well, something's going wrong with the methods of teaching and the standards of behavior in the lessons. Because if the, if the teacher's teaching, but nobody can hear the teacher because the behavior is so poor, then that will be why he hasn't l- uh, listened. Or if it's a combination of that, and he's heard it a few times, but memory was not a part of the goal of the lesson. So they were learning it by doing activities where they were directing themselves, the children direct the learning as opposed to the teacher directing the learning. And they have fun gluing bits of paper together and they they, 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 they maybe watch a film or something and it's all just fun and supposedly engaging. Um, when they, you know, they get out of the chairs and they have to pin things on each other's foreheads or around the room and people think, oh, look at this exciting class. And it looks exciting and it's very seductive. But in the end, He's leaving school not knowing what the Holocaust is. If, however, he'd been taught by the teacher standing at the front of the class um, all about the Holocaust, if then he'd done some analysis and some class discussion, a little bit of pair of work for a minute, and then they feed back to the teacher and they keep talking about it, and then they do a little written exercise, perhaps a reading comprehension on the Holocaust, that those methods will ensure that he remembers it. In addition, you send him home with some practice homework where the homework is practicing what they have done in the lesson as opposed to uh, expecting them to go and research something on the internet and that sort of thing, which is done so often um, and is a total waste of time. Um, You see, in in what I described, the teacher is very much in charge of the learning um, and that boy would then not be able to forget what the Holocaust is. Uh, the other me- more modern way of doing things means that he just doesn't remember because that's not how the brain learns. And all the brain science out there, how children learn, uh, demonstrate that um, what I'm talking about works, you know. Uh, the evidence is there. We just we just need to look at it and, and, and take it on board, really. It seems, you know, again, this isn't from an American perspective, you know, we've really jumped on board with standardized testing and it and it almost seems to me like we're we're testing to that testing day, but not really for retaining the information, which again I think leads into this problem of kids not knowing the Holocaust at the end. They they learned it at some time. They learned they needed to know it for the test, but then carrying it on well, didn't connect. Is is it, there a testing tests issue? are not a bad thing. Tests are good because if you don't have tests, then it, the, the children have uh, cannot be held to account and the teacher cannot be held to account. So tests are a good thing. Um, however, uh, if you teach badly and then you know the test is coming up, what ends up happening is that you teach towards the test because you haven't had time to teach generally So because you've taught badly for so long. So you then suddenly think, right, I need them to memorize these things that are on the test. <laughs> And then you teach towards the test. And that's a bad thing. But that comes from the initial mistake of not teaching well in the first place, right? Um, And then the stress of thinking, oh, my goodness, I've got to get them through this test. Um, But that doesn't mean that tests are bad in themselves. They're actually quite good. Um, They're good because they, they, they ought to hold people to account. The problem is, is that depending on the quality of the test, um, it, it, if it's a good test, it's very hard to teach towards the test. If it's a bad test, then it's quite easy and you can game it so that your children look as if they've done very well when actually they've just been taught towards the test. <laughs> um, I mean, that's, it's hard to explain without going into hours of conversation. Yeah, no. Actually, <laughs> actually did, you did a great job of that. It, it, it made perfect sense as, as I was listening to that. So... Um, one of the questions that I ask a lot of my guests is, you know, if you could design your own school, what would it look like and, and what would it be? And you really have been a part of designing a school with the Michaela School. Can you just talk about the Michaela School and maybe your role in um, Yeah, so in I'm its the development? principal, I'm the head. And um, uh, we've been open for five and a bit years. Uh, we've got about 700 pupils here, students, and um, uh, we're very old-fashioned uh, 
you know, Remembrance Day just happened today. In fact, it was 11 a.m. And we all stood for two minutes in silence. And we all wear a poppy. And there were assemblies that took place last week explaining about the loss of life and how there were people who, uh, who many young men who died um, so that we could be free. Um, we, you know, and, and the, the two minutes are taken really seriously. So, you know, I went up to one of the classrooms and stood with the children at, at 11 o'clock uh, to pay my respects. We have huge respect for the dead. And it's something that... Um, we hold very dear. We believe in values like uh, personal responsibility and a sense of duty to one's community and to one's family. Um, we believe in honour, you know, strength and honour. Um, these are kind of old-fashioned ways of seeing the world, which I feel have uh, almost disappeared, really. And it's all about one's rights instead of one's responsibilities. And it's all about me, 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 and um, what am I entitled to, as opposed to, you know what can you do for your country instead of what your country can do for you. That We are very much about what can you do, not just for your country, but for your community, for your family. Um, and um, we want the children to grow up into grateful human beings, adults. So uh, one of the reasons why we, I mean, obviously we recognize remembrance and, and, and have hold the two-minute silence because of what those young men all did for us, but we want the children on a larger level to just be grateful grateful to those men, grateful to their country, grateful to their parents, for and grateful to the school, for instance, for all that is done for them. Um, however bad your life is, uh, there are always things to be grateful for. Um, and I think that nowadays there is far too much indulgence in society, where we um, allow children to uh, complain all the time about what they've got and you know, it's not fair because so-and-so down the road is a millionaire and I'm not. Um, well, I'm not really interested in what they have down the road. I mean, look, we don't have any grass here. We're an inner city school. We uh, don't have any parking for the staff. We don't have any trees. We don't even have a sports hall. Uh, the children just have a small piece of uh, old car park. It used to be an old car park. Um that uh, we can't even fit the whole school out there at the same time, it's so small, and they've got a few picnic tables and a couple of basketball hoops, that's all they've got. Um, and I could sit around and feel sorry for ourselves because there's a school down just down the road that has amazing football pitches and um, amazing basketball courts and so on. And I could get angry about it, but what would be the point of that? You know, I've got to make the best, I've got to make do with what we've got. And um, I would say that, you know, it's the people inside the building that, that make us successful. And um, we've got a wonderful, happy school where we have really high standards of behavior and of, um, of, of hard work. And I'm hoping that those kinds of values are going to allow our children to make something of their lives uh, and be somebody. You know, you don't have to be some rich guy to, to be successful in life. You need to be good to be successful in life. You need to know what it is to be a good person. And that's what we want from our children. I'm very much about the whole child. You know, results, yes, matter. But the most important thing is what kind of person are you? Um, and I just think, unfortunately, in 2019, there is far too much indulgence that goes on in indulging children in their whims and in, their, in helping them nurse their grievances. Um, and that's just wrong because it turns them into whining adults as opposed to adults who are going to just graft and get on with it and make something of themselves. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're trying to make our, you know, boys and girls into young men and women who are going to go off and conquer the world. I've often thought, you know, and is this a private school or is this like a, a charter school model? Are, are you familiar with so charter school? It is a charter school. Okay. So we are what's called a free school in England, which is the equivalent to the charter school system. Um, and we're in the inner city, so it's not unusual for kids to turn up on bikes carrying knives and masked. And um, our kids, one kid came out the other day, got stabbed by a compass by a whole bunch of boys who rushed him from another school. You know, this is the inner city. Um, but we're transforming their lives, which is great. And I say we are transforming. We are, but they are transforming their own lives because they are taking on board the the values that we believe are important um, and will stand them in good stead for the future. Um, if, on the other hand, you know, we just complained about the status quo, 
And if we spend all that time saying, oh, the world is racist and it's sexist and it's mean and cold and hard, which it may very well be. I mean, I'm not saying it isn't. Um, but if that's all you do is complain, then what are you going to do? You're going to be on your deathbed at 85 and you look back and you say, oh, gosh, um, uh, you know, I, I couldn't make it in life because I was black or, uh, you know, I had a hard life because my father wasn't around or I, 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 life was difficult for me. And so that's why I'm a failure. Well, is that really what you want? Or do you want to have made something of your life despite the obstacles that were in front of you? Um, that's what we're all about. And that means not indulging in them and talking about them constantly. Okay, last question. I know you need to wrap things up. But um, yes. uh, technology, can you give me a quick answer about technology and education and your yeah, thoughts? Yeah, so I'm very anti-smartphone. Smartphones are awful. If any of your listeners have children, don't give them a smartphone. Uh, the big CEOs in California don't. When uh, Steve Jobs was asked about the iPad when it first came out, he was asked what his children thought of it, thought of it, and he said, "Well, why have my children have seen it? I mean, obviously, you don't give an iPad to a child." Um, same thing with the iPhone. Just do not give it to them. Uh, the pressure will be there. Uh, it's the worst possible thing you can do because you give your child unsupervised access to the internet, and that means one, they'll be watching porn like that. I guarantee. So you are giving your child video porn. That's what you're doing. Um, and uh, they will be making contact with all sorts of people who are undesirable, uh, members of gangs and all, horrible kids. Then you'll have on WhatsApp, they'll be cheating on their homework. They, one person does the homework, everyone else copies it. So, you know, it's up to you. You want to turn your child into a mess. You know, mental health problems, anxiety, depression, all of this comes from that smartphone use. So, you know, and, and you can say, oh, you know, some people say, oh, why is she saying this? It's not true. Well, I've got hundreds of children in front of me where the evidence is there. Those ones who stay away from their smartphones, funnily enough, they're doing really well and they're happy children. Those ones who are constantly on their phones are having breakdowns and are failing their exams. So, you know, it, and meeting terrible people. I've got mothers crying because their daughters have met some boy who's leading them astray and so on. I say boy, some young man, you know. Right. It's, it's so awful. And yet people don't listen. And I keep telling them and telling them and they just don't listen. So, um, yeah, it's... Um, it's, all, all I can do is keep saying it, you know, and I keep saying right. it loudly. Um, perhaps one of these days someone will take notice. <laughs> is there educational technology value? I mean, as your kids, what, what age level do you feel it's, it's good to introduce technology or? Um... Um, well, technology isn't bad. So it's smartphones that are bad. So if you are watching your child, we set online homework, for instance. We tell the parents they need to watch them. They can be on the computer and they can do the online homework as long as the parent is with them. You could even on your phone have some maths games and some, I don't know, jigsaw games and things like that, which actually uh, have them learning something. And if you're there with your child playing together, that's fine because your child then cannot start exploring the porn industry. Right. <laughs> um, but... It's, it's, it's the unsupervised point, right? If it's unsupervised, it's bad. If it's supervised, then I think it's a great thing. You know, you can do all sorts of things with them. I see. Okay, that that helped help make the distinction for me. Well, Catherine, thank yeah. you so much. You're doing such great stuff. You're a real inspiration. Thank I you. mean that. Um, and thank you thank for you. your time. Much thank appreciated. You. Thanks very much for having me. All right. All right then. Have Bye -bye. a great day.